I have to tell you, John, that, that line about this book is 250 pages of HR violations is like a blurb I wish I had for the paperback edition. That's a, uh, I think that would sell some books. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for that really lovely introduction and, and thank you for in inviting me to, to speak here. Um, I am always amazed when I get to go to places and I arrive and it looks like this place does and I, I can't, I have to pinch myself. I can't believe I get to do this for a living and go to these beautiful places. Uh, and I, I always call my wife and tell her, oh my God, I take pictures, you know. Uh, and she wanted me to tell you that she's, um, she's just glad to get rid of me for a day and someone else has to put up with me. So um, uh, there you have it. Um, my talk today is actually called Why Startups Win. And I want to talk about sort of what they do well, uh, what they do maybe not so well, and what other companies can, can learn from them. Uh, and I have this strange uh, or unique perspective or unusual perspective, I guess, uh, as the intro sort of indicated. I was a journalist for a long time, a tech journalist, and I worked at Forbes, I worked at Newsweek, um, and I just covered startups and big tech companies. Um, and then I, I worked on Silicon Valley for a couple seasons where I basically made fun of startups and you know, mocked them and, and wrote satire about them. I did the same on a blog for a long time where I pretended to be Steve Jobs. I had a blog called The Secret Diary of Steve Jobs that um, almost became a TV show in its own right, uh, where, again, it was just about sort of making fun of Silicon Valley. And then thirdly, I spent two years working inside uh, a startup called HubSpot in Cambridge. I live in Boston. And, uh, came out of that with this sort of 360 degree perspective about startups. The amazing thing is I went into HubSpot thinking that I was a really cynical, very savvy, you know, hard bitten journalist and I came out thinking that there was a level of cynicism that I, that I had actually been naive, you know what I mean? The scales fell from my eyes being inside one of these places. It was very, very different. Um, and so I wrote this book called Disrupted which sort of has a double meaning. One is about my own life being disrupted. At 52, I got laid off at Newsweek and tried to start over. And two, about you know, disruption of, of companies and industries and the way, the, the larger macro picture of, of the times we live in. Um, and the, the subtitle is My Misadventure in the Startup Bubble. And by bubble, I mean I think there is an economic bubble. There's a strange stock market bubble now. There's private uh, valuation bubble. But there's more importantly, the filter bubble that I think um, a lot of tech companies, especially a lot of these little startups, live in. They live in this sort of manufactured reality. And to walk into that from outside, to sort of cross through that membrane and step into it, it was like finding a remote tribe that hadn't ever had any contact with the outside world for seven years, and they were just in this, on this island. And they had their own set of beliefs and taboos and rituals, and it was, it was, it was a very strange experience. Um, to give you the, the short version of, of how things went for me at uh, HubSpot. I I'll show you uh, this slide, right? Um, the average age there was, was um, 26, and I was 52, right? Um, and I was sort of the, the token old guy. And um, I know all of you probably know who that guy is, but does anybody know, anybody recognize the guy on the left, the guy that I want to be? Um, I give a free copy of my book. If you just shout it out, if you, if you recognize a free copy, a signed copy of my book, if you can name that guy. Nobody can name him? No. So he's from a Viagra commercial. And, um, <laughs> and I realized, like, I am so old now, right, that the guy I aspire to be is the Viagra guy. When Viagra first came out, the ads showed genuinely old guys, like Bob Dole, you know, and I used to pity them, like, you poor old you know, whatever. Um, and now I want to be them, right? Like, it, it's like the best version of me. Like, if I lost weight, I worked out, I got a little buff, I grew a little bit of a beard, had a, would be almost as cool as the impotent Viagra guy, right? That's the, the, uh, the thing. And, and the thing is, it is partly that I've got older, but partly, you know, they have started making the Viagra models younger. Now, they're guys who like, they're like the silver fox guys who are maybe taking it just recreationally. I don't know. But they have the, the, uh, you know, they're always driving a Camaro, or they're, um, they're playing guitar, you know? And the one, I, the one I, I love the most is this one. They're in the bathtub. This is Cialis, but it's like, 
I have never understood this ad. Like, they're in two bathtubs. I don't know why, right? And I, I'm neurotic. So, so I always wonder, like, see this one. Like, where is that plumbing going to? Is there, is there actually, are there pipes going into these tubs? Like, this one, they're down at the beach. They're just out on, on the beach in a tub. And, and I'm 57 now. So all I can think is, like, God, it's going to be cold, right? Like, how does the water stay warm? You know, like, why are we in two tubs instead of one big tub, right? Um, should we go inside? Where I live, at this time of day, the bugs come out, you know, so you're not sitting there relaxing, you know. Um, anyway, um, this is a story that was on McSweeney's, a satire site recently. Welcome to our startup where everyone is 23 years old because we believe old people are visually displeasing and out of ideas. And for, for some reason, right, all sorts of people mailed me a link to this story. Hey, man, did you see this, Dan? Oh, like me. Like, like, why did you think I would care, you know? I wrote one book about being an old guy in a startup, and now I'm like typecast, right, as, as the old guy who worked with the young kids who hates millennials, right? And I really, I don't hate millennials at all, but um, every time a reporter does a story about age bias now, you know, anywhere in the world, I will get a call, like, do you want to give us, we need the angry old guy perspective, could you give us a couple angry old guy quotes, you know? It's like, um, I, I told my wife, it's like being an actor who's like typecast in a certain way, and it's not a pleasant way, but at least you get work, you know what I mean? Like, you know, your agent calls you, like, we have this guy from Game of Thrones, like, it's a fat, bald eunuch, would like you to come in and read for it, because we think you'd be perfect, like, really? Why? You know? Um, but then you think, well, it's work, right? Okay. Um, I got kids, you know? Um, so, to get to the real talk, I was at Newsweek when we were sold by the Washington Post for a dollar, a dollar, right? An 80-year-old institution that when I joined, I'd only been there for a short time, but a couple of years, but even when I joined, it was an institution, you know? And people of our generation, I think we understand, you know, what Newsweek used to be. The people I worked with at HubSpot, had heard of Newsweek, they maybe saw it in a dentist's office, but they had no idea what it meant. Like to me, getting a job at Newsweek was like, it took me 25 years of a career to climb up and up and up and get a better job, and I finally got to Newsweek, and I, was, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, and, the, and it all fell apart. And this was their last print issue. They went online only for a while. They've since changed hands again and again, and now they're, they're back, it's a different Newsweek. Someone just bought the brand, right? And, and what happened to us, I think, is something that maybe is happening in, in your not only in your own companies, but in your own field, in the learning and development field, which is that everything about our business, about how we did our jobs changed, like the way we created content, the way we distributed content, and the way content was consumed. All of that changed, and almost overnight, right? It may be a 10-year period. And it wasn't just us, it was our whole industry just kind of went under. Um, and then the question is, how do you keep this from happening to you, right? Like, um, what could we have done differently that would have kept this from happening? Because even at the time, I really believed, and I still believe, that there was no need for this to happen if we had done a few things. And ironically, things that maybe startups do do. Um, as a digression, I saw over the summer, there was this doctor in San Francisco who's doing blood transfusions, right? And it's very popular now with like middle-aged Silicon Valley guys, right? They, um, they pump you full of teenage blood, right, to get two liters for 8,000 bucks. And apparently, you know, you feel like Superman, right? So I called the guy, and I, this is him. He's a young doctor, and I asked him about it. He said, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's totally safe, it's simple. And I was kind of hoping a magazine would hire me to do an article, and I could go out and get them to pay for me to get one of these $8,000 transfusions to see what happens, right? And then he said something interesting. He said, like, not only can we slow the aging process, we think, you know, you can come once every six months, get a, a, a booster. We think if you did it more often, you can actually reverse the aging process, right? You could actually become younger, in effect. And he, he said there's no theoretical limit. And um, he said, we have a guy, he's 92 years old, and he comes every month, once a month, for his $8,000 blood transfusion. And he's like, and he looks, you know, fantastic. You should see him, right? So I'm telling this story for two reasons. One is, why on earth is a 92-year-old guy getting a blood transfusion? Like, you want to look 87? Like, that's going to help you, you know? You know no matter, no matter how, how, uh, how much teenage blood you have inside, you know, you're still the crypt keeper on the outside, right? You still look like that. Um, but the second reason I'm telling this story is, I just imagine the guy wanted to make, get a girlfriend or something. Dude, you're 92. Anyway, um, companies are doing the same thing. 
The same time this blood transfusion story hit me, I had been spending this past year talking to big companies that are all trying to basically, in a sense, give themselves blood transfusions, right? So you look at Ford. Ford is like uh, 114 years old, and, and they have a problem, which is that technology, I mean, transportation is becoming a tech problem, right? It's no longer about cars. Suddenly they have uh, Tesla coming after them, but they also have Google, right, and Apple, and maybe Uber, right? So they have these little venture capital, venture funded or, or, or enormously profitable uh, Silicon Valley companies coming at them. And they've figured out that the real future of technology, of, of transportation is not like cars. It's going to be mapping services, it's AI, it's autonomous vehicles, right? Um, so Ford is basically trying to transform itself. They're hiring AI engineers as fast as they can get them, right? If you're a, an AI engineer now who knows autonomous vehicles, who has any experience like coming out of Carnegie Mellon, you're worth a fortune. Some, some, one estimate is you're worth $10 million. Like that's, they're like you know, pro sports players right now. Um, and not only are they trying to hire new people, they're, they're scraping their, their whole campus in Detroit. This is an artist rendition. And they're going to build a Googleplex, right? Mark Fields announced this, so we're going, to, we're going to build a campus that looks like Google. A, because we can recruit, right? Because you, believe it or not, it's pretty hard to get a really hot AI engineer from Carnegie Mellon to move to Detroit instead of the Bay Area, right? And, and B, to send a message, I'm convinced it's to send a message to the people who are still there, the 200,000 people who are still at Ford is like, look, we got to change, like you have to change. If you're going to stay here, we're going to be a different company in 10 years than we are now, and we need different people, or you have to become one of those different people. So that's what, that's what Ford is, is up against, and, and that's what they're doing. They not only need new products, more than new products, what they need is like a new business model. If you talk to people at Ford, they're saying like 10 years from now, you may not own a car. You may, get a, you may subscribe to a car the way you subscribe to Spotify, right? You might just uh, pay a monthly fee, and if you don't need a car, we'll send a car service like an Uber that we run. And during the week, and on weekends you need a car, and a self-driving car will drive itself to your house, you'll have it for the weekend, you bring it home Sunday, it'll drive itself back, it'll go in for an oil change, you know. This is the kind of world they're envisioning. GE is in the middle of moving to Boston, where I live, and they're adopting Lean. So, that, you know, this is book, The Lean Startup, Eric Ries's famous book, million copy bestseller. Jeff Immelt took The Lean Startup and is pushing it all throughout GE basically turning them into a startup. And again, this is the, the rendition of what they're going to have in, in Boston. It looks like a startup, right? It, 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 I realize it's superficial, but I think it's, it's symbolically important to the people. This is where they used to be, and this is a great quote, GE official, Fairfield headquarters was a morgue, right? I mean, you can imagine walking into this old place every week and thinking, like, this is just a morgue. This is where we're going to die. This is where GE dies, right? Um, Aetna. 164 years old. They're moving to Chelsea. Another kind of building looks sort of the same, right? Um, Walmart's doing something different. They are not uh, building a new campus. What they've done is they've set up a, an innovation lab. And they, you know, they're very startup-y. They call it at Walmart Labs, all one word. And it's in San Bruno, south of San Francisco. They're the baby of the group. They're only 55 years old. And they have a second one they've opened in Bangalore. And they're basically saying, we're not a retailer competing in Silicon Valley. We're building an internet technology company inside our own company. Sort of what Ford is doing. Ford is saying, we're going to build a tech company. We're going to build a Google inside our own walls. So they have all this stuff, you know, the bright basic colors, the little kindergarten decor, and then they have a guy on a scooter. You know, every one of these pieces, some, some poor guy has to like, go get on the scooter. Come on, we're taking a picture, you know. Get on the scooter. Um, I, I feel like no grown man should be riding a scooter or a skateboard. For a while, I worked in... in San Francisco for a half a year once, and they were like, guys, not my age, but like, you know, men, grown men on skateboards, and I feel like that should be out against the law. There should be an age cutoff. You know, you can't ride a skateboard to work after a certain age. Um, what all these guys are after is reinvention, basically, essentially, all these old guys, right? They basically take this old cadaver, zap it with new life, and, and, and bring it back to life, right? And it has to happen at two levels. One is the individual, and the other is the organization. And the organization really can't change unless the individuals change, which is why I think your role is so vital, so uh, central to this reinvention. Because um, the other thing I think is interesting is that basically everybody has realized now, I don't think companies need to tell people anymore, they're not going to hold your hand and they're not going to teach you and they're not going to retrain you. It's not going to be like, oh, you're going to get laid off here, so we're going to put you through a six month. Like, it, you're on your own. Like, figure this out. Right? That's where I found myself. Like, and I think a lot of us have figured that out. That you know, if you want to work for the next 10 years, which I want to do, you better figure this out. Um, 
The title of my talk is somewhat misleading because I called it Why Startups uh, Win, and in fact, most fail, right? Like 75%. Some estimates are 90%. And another caveat is that there are things about startups that you don't want to copy. But please keep this number in mind, this slide in mind, later in the talk, the 75% number, right? It's an important thing. But when they do win, they win really big. So when Amazon wins, it becomes a huge win, and it really affects other people. Right? Startups have unfair advantages. Right? One is they're starting from scratch. Most of us have an old company, and we're trying to breathe new life into it. We have to get rid of the old culture, infuse a new culture. These guys just start from scratch. In, in the case of HubSpot, where I worked, they just make up a culture. They just literally write this thing, and it is, that's what they say their culture is. The other unfair advantage, and this is a really huge one, and it was the one thing that I found most shocking when I was at HubSpot in the year since, is that they don't have to make money. Right? They don't have to make a profit. They can lose money for years, sometimes indefinitely. Twitter has never made money. Right? It's lost billions of dollars. Twitter's a fantastic tool. I use it all the time. But as a business, none of us could probably go into our boss or our CEO and say, look, I got this great idea, I want to build it. It's going to lose like $3 billion over the next 10 years. Are you okay with that? <laughs> like, no. But these guys can, right? I'll give you one really painful and amazing example, right? So Ford versus Tesla. Ford last year sold 6 million vehicles. Um, they made a net profit of $4.6 billion, which was lower. The year before was $7 billion. Or something. But, and their market value is $47 billion. Tesla last year made only 50,000 vehicles. You wouldn't know that because there were probably 50,000 articles written about Tesla last year, right? But they, they don't make that many cars. They lost almost $700 million doing it, right? They lose money on every one of those cool cars you see on the road. But their market value is $57 billion, more than Ford's. $10 billion more than Ford, right? Since 2012, Tesla has lost an accumulated $3.1 billion their debt, they now are carrying $10 billion in debt. Uh, five years ago, they had $460 million. The debt's gone up 22 times, and the stock in those five years has gone up 12 times. So it's not even crazy venture capitalists that will support this, but the public markets now will support disruptors. So imagine you're a Ford, and you're, like, you're like fighting with one arm behind your back. You have, you've got this opponent who can just go on basically selling dollar bills for 50 cents. right? Um, so. This is not just those two. I recently did this list. I was writing a column for Fortune for a while, and I made a list of all the tech IPOs since 2011. I subtracted the ones that had been acquired, that were no longer independent. I ended up with 60 companies that were still in the market. Only 10 of them had ever made a profit. So this is not an anomaly. Tesla's situation is not an anomaly. This is the new normal, right? This is like what the market will now do. And this is before the Snap IPO. You've probably heard of Snapchat, obviously, and the Snap IPO it was a hot IPO. It's now below its price. Snap went public, and this was its pitch to investors. I couldn't believe this. Well, over the last, they were founded in 2011. It was 2017. Over the last six years, well, uh, through 2016, we have an accumulated deficit of $1.5 billion. We've lost a billion and a half. In fact, half a billion of it was just this past year, 2016. So buy our stock, right? And you get no voting rights. That's bad enough. In the first half of this year alone, they've lost another billion and a half dollars. And they're considered like one of the hot unicorns in Silicon Valley, right? So now imagine you're a newspaper or you're a magazine, because essentially they're, they're selling ad dollars. That's what you're up against. If you're, trying to, if you're trying to start a business that's built on advertising, you have to compete against Google and Facebook, the duopoly that sell ads, right? And then Snap, which can just give stuff away, right? Um, so it's not a fair fight. And yet, if you don't do something, this is where you end up. If you don't adapt, you, know, you end up as us, Newsweek. And anyway, this sort of leads me into the, the, the HubSpot talk. This is where I am. 2012, I get a call on a Friday morning, my boss. And I think she wants to talk about this new blog we're doing. My, I had just told my wife to quit her teaching job. She was having some health problems. I said, it's OK. Newsweek's looking solid. I know we're rocky for a while. Things are looking good. We had booked a three-week vacation to Austria. We had saved up. We we're going to go on this great trip with our kids. And um, one Friday, my editor calls and says, yeah, your job doesn't exist anymore. And I'm like, wait a minute, what does that mean? Like my, she was a friend of mine. I was like, my job doesn't exist anymore. It's a nice way of telling you, get out, right? Two weeks pay, bye, right? No severance, no package, bye. And I'm like, OK, well, I'll get a job, right? So I call Time. 
some of my friends right there, like, oh, we're not hiring, we're laying off, right? I call Forbes where I used to work, like, oh, we can give you a couple freelance, nothing. Like, the, I realized it's not my company that's going out of business, my business is going out of business, right? So I think, okay, for years I've wanted to work at a tech company, I was always jealous of those guys, right? I'm gonna go work at a startup, right? I'm gonna go work at a uh, uh, startup, I'm gonna learn the new economy. I've spent my whole life working in companies that are, that are 80 years old, you know, or more. Forbes is celebrating its 100th anniversary with you. So these are old 20th century companies. I was a 20th century man, right? And I'm realizing I'm in the 21st century. Things have changed. So there was this new way of working that I wanted to see, a new way of engaging, uh, the way of companies engaging with employees, right? HubSpot, where I went, was founded in 2005. So they were brand new, starting from scratch, as new as new could be. And there's more of this in the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit here. One is, the one thing I heard over and over and over again, uh, whatever you did in your previous job, whatever, whoever you were, whatever your title was, right, you know, whoever you used to be or think you used to be, like, it means nothing here. It means nothing, right? In fact, whatever experience you have, your experience is probably a bad thing because it, it's going to, you have all the wrong habits, right? You're not open to stuff, right? And Millennials at this place who are running this place were basically presenting themselves like, look, we're the best, smartest, savviest generation there is, right? Like, um, we're digital natives, right? We speak this language as our first language. For you, you're always going to be someone speaking this as a second language. So try to keep up, you know? And as I said, I was 52 years old. Average was 26. I was literally double the age of the average person. There was one guy in the whole company older than me who found me on my first day and wanted to become best friends. He was so lonely, right? And um, <laughs> almost everybody was right out of college. My first day, you know, you go around, you interview people, and you say, like, oh, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. Now, where were you before? And they would go, uh, college? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I stopped asking that, right? Um, and this was not by accident, right? The, the CEO, while I was there, gave an interview with the, the New York Times where he said, like, no, we're specifically trying to create a culture to recruit and retain millennials, Gen Ys. We, we just want all Gen Ys. They're the best. And the quote that he gave was, gray hair and experience are really overrated. And I'm sitting there in my little box like, oh, my God. Like, you know, this is what this guy thinks of me, right? Um, kids called me Grandpa Buzz, right? One day, the, the head of PR came to me. He's like, you're doing so great. We want to pitch a story to get some buzz for us. We're going to call it uh, Old Dog New Tricks. I'm like, I'm the old dog. He's like, yeah, but you're doing so great. I mean, it's like, you're an old guy, but you're really adapted. And I'm like, you know, let me just think about that. You know, can I, can I get back to you on that one? I don't know. You know, I don't want to be like the face of the elder population here, you know, like the old guy who can learn. Although now I'm so desperate when my book came out, I like begged AARP to write about it. Please, you know. <laughs> old people will love this book, you know. Um, so... I was not starting out from zero. I realized I was starting out less than zero, negative numbers, right? There was definitely a bias against people my age. Another guy who joined after me who was 43 came in on his first day. He said it was like Logan's Run. You know, there's like a, a sci-fi movie where you die at 30 to prevent overpopulation. Just at 30, you're dead, right? Um, so if you wanted to learn about millennials, this was like a pure play view into their world. And I knew it would be hard, but to be honest, like, I liked working with a bunch of young people. I, I thought they were great. They had great ideas. And I had spent all these years at Forbes and Newsweek going like, we cannot figure out our own business. The answers are out there, but it's basically the next generation of young people. They're going to figure out the media business. So I want to go work with them. That's great, right? But on day one, I start freaking out. Like, I found out that the kid who was giving me a tour around the office that I thought was someone's admin actually was going to be my boss. Right? I was like, oh, that's a bad thing, right? Um, and, um, but at the end of the day, I'm taking these deep breaths. I'm like, I, you know, I'm like, I think this is going to be bad, but I, I've committed to myself to do this for a year. I'm not going to give up, right? This is what the, the lobby looked like. This is the HubSpot lobby. And they basically had every startup cliche you can imagine, right? They had, um, uh, you know, dogs in the office. We had um, a nap room. We had beer in the fridge, lots of free food. We had a candy wall. We had these uh, beanbag chairs everywhere. It, like a conference room, you'd be in a conference. Instead of sitting at a table and chairs, you'd all be sitting on beanbag chairs like this, trying to meet, you know? And for me, that's not bad getting into the beanbag, getting out of the beanbag, you know, is the problem. It sucks, right? It's really bad. Don't ever do it if you're over a certain age, right? Um, we had guys, the lacrosse bros who like worked in soils that do like, they had a push-up club in the lobby at lunchtime. Yeah, dude, like you ever, you know, join us. I was like, I'm going to lunch. I'm not going to do push-ups with you idiots, you know? Um, and it was like, basically, it was like, it, it was like a combination of a frat house, 
a Montessori kindergarten, and a Scientology compound, <laughs> right? That was like the three, the three elements that they had blended. This is some pictures of the place. So there's a beanbag chair and the candy wall. And they had chalkboards. They loved chalkboards. They loved to write everywhere. Like we used to call it, in my age, it was graffiti, but now it's like, you know, it's decor. It's free wallpaper, right? But they couldn't come up with ideas, so they'd always write things, sad things like, HubSpot equals cool. I'd be like, oh, oh yeah. There's a guy in the nap room, not sleeping, but working, because that's cool. And then this thing, everybody in my age, you know, this is a supply closet, right? They called this the camping room, but come on, this is a box with a fake window on the side. And what do you do? You go in and sit there and look at the wall? Like, I didn't, under why would I do this? Give someone an office. No, we couldn't have offices. There was, we had no offices. You had to sit out in the open, and every three months or six months, you had to change seats, like musical chairs, and they called it a seating hack. So you remember that, like, you know, um, change is the only constant, right? So, okay, great. You know. So you just get settled into this place, you get your kids' pictures down, like, geez, now you gotta move again, right? Okay, great. Um, and then we had this training session, right? What is your superpower? We all had superpowers, right? This is like millennial, and millennials love this stuff. So if you are dealing with millennials, just take this, right? I mean, we went into this. We were supposed to learn how to use the software, but really it was just brainwashing. It was like indoctrination. I grew up Catholic, so I'm really, and I went to Catholic school, so I know this drill, right? So I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know. It's like the Baltimore catechism, right? Only, only it's like the HubSpot culture code. So, okay, they would go, you know, it's harder to get a job here than to get into Harvard. And you, you got a job here. Thousands of people wanted that job, but you got it because of your superpowers, right? And then they do the thing, like, let's go, all go around and introduce ourselves and tell something that no one knows about you, something that makes you different, something that only you, you know, the only one here who's done. And I'm like, oh, I hate this stuff. Like, I hate this stuff so much. Like, I'm a journalist. No, you know, the kid next to me is right out of college. He's like, I think I'm going to get my own place. Do you have your own place? I'm like, yeah, I have my own place. <laughs> you know, yeah, I have a, a house and kids. I have you know, a mortgage. You know what that is? But trust me, it sucks. That's what it is, right? Uh, that's why I'm here sitting next to you, right? You know, it's like, um, so we go around, and they're like, I play in a heavy metal band, and all. I, I was a camp counselor. I'm like, I'm the only one here who's had a colonoscopy. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's a hose. Wait till you turn 50. Unbelievable, right? Great. So fantastic. And then we had this, this culture code. This one doesn't show up very well, but creating a company we love was a code, right? And it really, it turns out, this really angered people at the company, because one of the co-founders just made this up. It was 128 slides that told you how to be HubSpotty, right? What it meant to be HubSpotty and to be lovable. But of course, it wasn't anything to do with reality, so people just got angry at it. Um, this is another one of my favorites. This is a true story. Uh, the two founders came from MIT, right? And they were so full of themselves. They thought, like, not only are we going to make software, which would be hard enough, we're also going to reinvent how a company is run. Like, we're going to make a new company because we don't like those old companies, man, with all their old ideas. So, like, we're not going to have HR. No HR, because we always hated HR. No, no HR. None. Figure it out on your own, right? One woman would go on maternity leave, get six weeks. Another would go on maternity leave, get none. Another would get 12. They'd be like, what? Um, no org chart. 500 people when I got there, you didn't know who reported to whom because, no, 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 we can't have an org chart. Why? I don't know. You just can't, right? Uh, it was an experiment. It was a, basically these two guys said, what would happen if you created a company, you hired only or almost only people who were right out of college who had never had a job, had never worked anywhere, and you put them in a big room, you gave them no rules, no management, no training, no guidance, and you just said, go, right, figure it out. You know, what happens is Lord of the Flies, right? You can, by the time I got the kids with spears, you know, the mean kids are ruling the, the nice kids, right? That's basically what happens, right? Um, this teddy bear is there for a reason. A few months in, I'm starting to think this place is crazy. The, 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 I'm a slow learner. Come on, you know. You know, adult learners, we like to learn by doing, and it, repetition is a big thing. So it took me months. But um, the, C, the CTO, the co-founder, publishes an article on LinkedIn. He's had a huge management breakthrough. He wants everybody to know about it. Companies should always focus on the customer, always solve for the customer. But, you know, we lose sight of the customer because the customer isn't there with us in meetings. So I got this teddy bear. This is a real picture. This is the CTO. This is the CMO. I named her Molly, and I bring her to all my meetings, and I put her in a chair. She's sitting up on a little box, I think, there. She's sitting on something. She's got a Red Bull in front of her. She's looking pissed off. But she's like, um, she's going to cut someone a new one. Watch out. So she's like, um, and, and we all have to ask, any, any decision we're making, what, is, what does Molly think? What does the customer think, right? So I read this, and I'm like, this is nuts. This guy's going to get crucified in the comments, right? But no. People are reading it going like, that's a great idea. I'm going to start bringing a stuffed animal to my meetings. I'm like, what? Have I gone through the, I'm like Alice in Wonderland here. So the kid, my boss, Jay, he's facing me on a monitor. I look around the monitor. I'm like, dude, 
just came out. This teddy bear, did you read that story? He's like, yeah. He's like, that's nuts, right? He's like, oh, no, I think it's really good. I'm like, come on, man. You worked at Google. If Sergey Brin started bringing a teddy bear to meetings, it would be okay. He's like, no, but startup, you know, they're eccentric. So no one would laugh. That was the scarier thing. Scarier than the teddy bear itself was the fact that no one would laugh at the teddy bear. Because if Newsweek, if the managing editor said, I'm going to bring in a teddy bear and that's going to be the reader, and every, every story meeting we have to talk to the teddy bear, I mean, people would have had teddy bears in bondage gear. We would have had, you know, teddy bears hanging. I mean, it would have been awful, right? The guy would never live it down. We'd buy giant teddy bears from F.A.O. Schwartz, you know. Uh, but here, it was a breakthrough. I called a friend of mine a former journalist who had gone into marketing, like me, he kind of counseled me on this. He's like, this is a good transition for journalists. You go into marketing, right? I call him and said, I know you told me the corporate world's a little weird, right? But like, did you read this article? And he's like, dude, that's Jonestown. Okay, get out. Like, they're going to make you drink Kool-Aid, right? This is, this is a cult, right? Um, this is not normal corporate behavior, right? So the, the main thing was that they were... To be HubSpot, he meant to be peppy, to be perky, to be cheery and upbeat and to love the company. Like, we dare to be different. That was our big Halloween party. Like, one of their big rituals every year, they had Halloween. And everybody came to work in these elaborate costumes, you know? Um, and if you had to pose for a picture, you always had to be jumping. Millennials love to do this. They, they'll take it over and over and, and try to get everybody up in the air. You know, they can't just stand there anymore. No, they have to be jumping, right? I, I know all of these people, by the way. Um, I didn't take the picture, but... Um, there was a woman who used to sign her emails. Her signature was, go HubSpot, go! And I was like, just really love the place. And they had this thing that I came to call praisegasms, where they figured out that the way to get ahead, the way to get a promotion, right, was not to be good at what you did, to be like super, well, that might help, but it didn't really matter. But it was to be praising others, right? That was, the, oh my God, that person's a real team player. He's a GSD, get shit done, you know? And so... <laughs> Yeah, they had a lot of acronyms, KPIs, DRIs. I was like, why don't we, do, what's a KPI? They were like, you know, key performance indicator. It's a goal. I said, like, why don't we just call it the goal? And the DRI is a directly responsible individual. Why don't we just say that's the person in charge? Like, no, 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 that's not what we do. We call them KPIs and DRIs. I'm like, yeah, but that's stupid, right? Anyway, so um, why don't we just use English? Well, no, no, not English, God. So, um, so praisegasms were the way to get great attention for yourself would be to say, you know, Amber, she's so great. Man, last week she did this thing for me, and she's so she did such she went over over and above, just such a great job, right? Now anywhere I'd worked, if you wanted to thank Amber, you'd send her a note saying, Amber, thank you for that. That was really great. You are really terrific. If you really wanted to be a mensch, you'd see see her boss and say, you know what, this this woman really is amazing. You should give her a raise, right? Give her a promotion. But what they did at HubSpot was, we'd get an email to the entire department, 60 people in marketing. We'd get things saying. I just want everyone to know that Amber last week was running the blog all by herself, and she totally crushed it. She's the best, right? And then, that's bad enough. Like, I don't need to read this. I don't care, right? But um, the protocol was that everybody on that list would do a reply to all and add their own one sentence saying, like, yeah, Amber rocks. You go, girl, blah, 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 all right? And I'm grumpy, and I'm old, and I'm just sitting there going, delete, 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 you know, like... Ah, oh, my inbox is filling up with this like eruption of like praise. Oh my God, right? So then finally I realized oh, I'm gonna get in on this, right? So I started writing things like, yeah, Amber, or I'd do like Amber, you know, with like lots of letters and then like a thousand exclamation points, like and then they figured out like stop being a jerk, you know what I mean? Like I got caught. They do understand sarcasm. Be careful with <laughs> with with them. They they get it. I thought maybe they wouldn't. They do. The creepiest, scariest thing of all, and I swear this is true, is when they fired you, they called it graduation. And they would, they would try to be cheery about it. They'd send out an email saying, hey team, just want you to know that Derek has graduated. We can't wait to see what he's going to do with his superpowers on his next big rock star adventure. You know? And I'd be like, dude, you just fired that guy, right? You know? And you'd look over, the desk is already gone. He said, boom, he's disappeared. Like the dis they disappeared him in the night. You don't even know he's like, it's like living in Argentina in the 1970s. Just people taken from their homes. I, I don't know. Alien abduction, you know, spinal tap drummers, poof, you know, pi pile of dust left on the chair. And no one would ever talk about him again. And this happened all the time. There were more people getting fired at this place than at Newsweek, which was going out of business. They were firing people all the time, right? And I found out that this is a new thing. And this is actually something interesting and worth latching onto. This is new compact. And they really... They don't see this as a problem. They celebrate this. We hire fast, we fire fast, right? And uh, we're a team, not a family. This is the slogan. It started at Netflix. HubSpot stole it for their culture code. So the culture code that began with creating a company we love 
deep inside has this little thing saying, we're a team, not a family. By the way, we're going to get rid of you if we don't like you anymore, right? Uh, we need to have superstars in every position. Like, I don't know what a superstar telemarketer is, but I mean, apparently there are superstars telemarketers. Um, and it's maybe not nice. It's definitely not nice. But this is now the norm, right? This is also what you're competing with. You're competing with companies that no longer see any need to provide longevity, that tell people up front, this is not a career. You didn't come here. This is a transaction. This is a tour of duty. You're going to be a year or two. See you later. Bye. If you ever say you're welcome, we'll let you know. In my case, that's what happened. Um, so, so what do they do that's, um, that's so amazing? How do they win? When they do win, how do they win? What can we extract from this crazy world that's actually useful, right? Um, eventually, I graduated, right? To, no big surprise there, right? And they did to me, though, what they did um, uh, when, when you're old. So they can't fire you, but they really want you to leave. So they, they had one guy just make my life a living hell. You know that? And I was like, I know that's what he's doing. My sister works in HR, so I was like, is this what he's doing? She's like, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna stay and just see what this guy does come up with. Like, and he was super creative. He was like the Michelangelo of being a sociopath. He was really good at it, you know? <laughs> I would call my sister once in a while, I'd be like, okay, so he, today he did this. He's like, oh, he's a sophisticated move. That's a, you know, the very high level. He's like a Jedi Knight of, of abusing people. And uh, so one thing they do, is they recruit and retain millennials. And most companies can't do this, right? It is true. Most companies, you know, they just can't get people to come work there, right? Um, it's hard to explain to people my age, however, that this is what work look, looks like. When we went to work, well, look at how we all dress even now, today. But when we went to work, most of us guys, you probably had a tie, you had a suit. When I went, took a job at Forbes, I had to go buy a couple suits. And I felt great. I was like, I'm a big boy now. I have, I have a suit and I have man shoes, you know? And it was great. Like, lumberjacks in those days, they worked in the forest. They didn't come into the office during the day, you know? There's a tree down in accounting. We need this guy up there. Get up here. He's got, he's got spikes on his shoes. And, uh, miss, I don't know why you're wearing your ski hat inside, but, but you are. Um, Anyway, this is, but this is what they look like, right? I love this, and, and the way they get it, everybody thinks it's about all the, the parties and the ping pong, and it is kind of, but the main thing is empowerment. Most of these kids are just like us. When we were 25, like, I couldn't wait. I wanted all the old people to get out of my way. I wanted to run things now, right? And that's what they want. They want to be in charge of something, anything. We had kids who were just like, just make me the boss of even one person, please, you know? Um, at HubSpot, you know, and HubSpot, what they do, they really would empower them. They would give them stuff that was way too much for them promote people way too early, and they would tolerate a great deal of chaos because they, A, it was cheaper and to have young people, but B, they figured they're going to come up with new ways of doing things. If they have to figure it out on, on their own, yes, there'll be some reinventing of the wheel, there'll be some chaos, there'll be a lot of mistakes, but something fresh and new will come out of it. So they really are not afraid to take you know, a, a really young person with no experience and put them into a management position. Unfortunately, they also didn't train them. I love this picture because this is the millennial guy explaining to like me or again, Viagra man, the guy I'd like to look like, right? But the handsome version of me, he's saying to him, like, no, 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 you know, there isn't a special Twitter terminal. No, no, Bob, no, you don't, and you don't have to print it out. Well, you just type it in yourself. That's how you use Twitter. They used to ask me, do you know how to use Twitter, Dan? I'd be like, yeah, like, it's not rocket science, you know, with 140 characters, I can do it. Um, but they really want promotions. HubSpot, another thing they did that tricked people, but it worked, was they would just give them lofty titles. So everybody had like a senior associate director of this, right? You know, they, it was the same job they had before, but they just gave them a new title. I think it's so they can tell their parents, I got a promotion, right? Because the, the, these are kids, that whole generation, the parents have pushed them, pushed them, pushed them, get into college, get a job. Why didn't you get a promotion yet? Um, and there's this. I call it the three Ps, parties, perks, purpose. And I th I'm very cynical about it, but I think they make up all this stuff. Perks, parties and perks, you know, beer pong, like, yeah, we played beer pong. We just did it at home. We didn't go to work and do it. Like, I don't know why people need to go to work and play beer pong, but they do, right? They want to socialize at work. And I had a VC tell me once, I was saying, I don't understand, this company loses all this money, and yet you're spending all this money on, like, beer and all these parties and all this bullshit, you know? And he's like, look, dude, beer is cheap. They can have all the beer they want. What they can't have is equity, right? We can them at 11 months, right, before they get their first quarter of vesting or maybe two years. Nobody lasts four years, nobody vests, and even if they do vest, we make it really hard for them to figure out how to exercise their options. They're never gonna get any equity, but here, have some beer, right? Maybe you'll meet a girl, you know, like, oh, wouldn't that be great, you know? You know, you'll have friends, you know, oh, cool, right? So, <clears throat> and purpose, I'm equally cynical about. I mean, we made email marketing spam. That's what HubSpot did. We did the software that when you get those emails in your inbox, that annoying thing from some vendor saying, I saw you looked at a pair of shoes, right? That was us, right? 
But they would tell these guys, no, you're changing the world. This is an important mission that you're on. And I think this generation is so hungry for a mission that you can tell them almost anything does is a mission and they will believe it, right? They also love decor and location. And um, you know, those, those new uh, headquarters, that's a real thing. Uh, a company in Boston called Acquia, which is a startup, was out in the burbs in one of those boring little you know, tracks, and they couldn't recruit. And what they did is they had to move into downtown Boston, which the old people hated because now it's a pain of a commute. But it was the only way they could get millennials to work there. They wanted to be in the city. They like urban locations. And decor really matters. And I love this thing because this is a new thing that came out this week. It's called the pause pod. Someone invented it. So you can, you can, it folds up and you can carry it to work and then pop it open and sit in it, right? And, and you can stick your legs out this side. There's a little thing. Someone wrote on Twitter saying, congratulations, you've invented a tent, right? But, and there's a great video that I highly recommend you go watch of Pause Pause. Just search for this. Because I like this guy's like the emo millennial. And he's like, I do, you know, social media marketing content, but I'm really on a search for meaning. And this is the sad guy who just is eating banana in his pod pod. He brought it into the office. He said, because he doesn't like to eat in front of other people. It's like Zach Galifianakis from The Hangover. He's Alan. He's like, no, I, I can eat my banana. It's the saddest thing ever. But millennials love this junk. If you gave out pause pods, they think this is cool, right? <clears throat> More important, they focus on speed. Zuckerberg, move fast and break things was their original motto, right? They really, really want to get stuff done now. There's a sense of urgency, right? Um, they changed it later to move fast with stable infra as they got bigger because they realized if you just move fast and break things, you end up with a lot of broken things, right? So, um, and then they still have on the wall all over HubSpot, spot all the wall, done is better than perfect. Like, don't worry about getting it perfect. You don't have to polish this thing. They ship beta, right? What we used to call beta, they ship, they ship, they ship alpha, right? I mean, there is no sense of like, you know, the waterfall process. HubSpot has a thing called the hacker way. And when they talk about hacking, they just mean like, you know, doing stuff quickly, getting it out there, you know, sort of slapdash, throwing it together. Something can always be better, nothing's ever complete. So if it's never complete, you really don't have to worry about it, right? So it's actually very freeing. And the one thing I think really distinguished the people I worked with at HubSpot for me was fear. I was filled with fear, right? They had none, none. <clears throat> they, had not, they had nothing to lose, right? Me, I, you know, I spent my whole life in these things. I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid how I, I won't know how to use the technology. I won't be able to do this. Our generation, you know, we went through three crashes, 87, 2001, 2008. You know, we have legitimate reasons to be fearful. Our generation got killed in 2008 and 9 and 10 in the layoffs. We were the ones who bore the brunt of that. I saw a friend of mine from high school the other night. He said, we're the lost generation. You know, we're the ones that nobody cares about. The ones ahead of us retired, the ones behind us are millennials, and we're just supposed to figure it out. We're caught in the washing machine. But these guys have no fear, right? And, and, and the reason they don't <clears throat> is that it's institutionalized that they, sh not only do they have permission to try crazy things, they have an commandments, they have an order to try crazy things. If they're not trying crazy things, they're failing, right? The only way they can fail is just not being crazy. At Newsweek, for example, Facebook will put out you can make a list of two dozen things that Facebook over the last few years has announced with great fanfare at their big F8 conference. It's gonna change the world, it's gonna blah, blah, blah. And then six months later, it fizzles out and it goes away. Over and over and over again. And I used to think like, you know, that's embarrassing, but they don't, they're not embarrassed at all, right? At Newsweek, we would have been traumatized by one of those experiences. Like, so we tend to avoid that, we would have spent six months, we would have done a pilot, we would have, tested the pilot internally, we would have done a soft launch to see if anybody liked it, then we'd finally roll it out, we'd spend a million dollars on marketing and promotion, and then it would fizzle and we'd be, we'd be ashamed. Because we have this culture of blame and shame, right? So if you were the one who had pio you know, pioneered that project and it failed, now you're a dud inside the office, right? So nobody wants to stick their neck out because nobody wants to be that guy. And the, the institution, it becomes more and more fearful. These guys don't have it, they have the opposite of that, which I thought was amazing, like I really, really, admired that. And it, it, I don't think it was an age thing, but it was, a, it was a systematic thing. I'll tell you one example of something super crazy they did, because it's funny. A, a woman came up, one of the millennials came up with the idea, you know, we sold blog software too, to like small businesses, plumbing, plumbers, pool installers, florist shops. And once they got the blog up and running, then they had to write a blog, right? But they didn't know how to write blogs. And so the, the, seriously, a big problem we had in terms of usage of our product was that people would be like, I don't like to blog. I don't know what to write about. So we said, let's make, it, so said, let's make it easy for them. We'll make a Mad Libs generator. You put in three keywords, press a button, and it'll spit up a bunch of titles. Now, it won't write the blog post for you, but it'll give you the titles, and now that'll spur you. Now just write the blog post based off that title. This is obviously a really bad idea, right? Like, 
my, at my age, you know, knowing what I know, I, I'm looking at it going, no, this is really, really bad. First of all, because our message is to people that you should be making special, unique, lovable content that really, you know, is special and stands out. And then we're saying, but here's a machine that'll come up with stupid ideas for you, right? Um, not only that, the woman, we didn't have any AI, right? The, the, the machine, the algorithm running this was just based on the woman who came up with the idea. And she had a thing like, she liked listicles, BuzzFeed things like five reasons for this, 10 reasons for that, eight reasons, seven things you should know. And she loved Miley Cyrus, you know? Um, I didn't know this about her, but apparently she did. So she programmed this thing. And we rolled it out, big thing, you know, Tuesday morning. This is it, the blog title thing. And, and people started, we hadn't tested it, so people started testing it and writing comments to us about it. And one woman said, you know, I think maybe you should, uh, in the comments, we, I think maybe you can take another pass on this. I, this looked like a great idea. I run the blog for a, a hospital system in St. Louis or something, and, and this month is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. And I really have been stuck. I, can't, I don't know what to write about. And I tried your thing, but it came up with this, and these are real. Why we love cervical cancer, and you should too, right? Miley Cyrus and cervical cancer, 10 things they have in common, right? <clears throat> and we're like, oh, I guess I could have seen that coming, right? You know, um, but of course, my friends hear about this, and they all start, you know, writing in things like, you know, Zach Galifianakis and anal warts, you know, and they're just doing, you know, like, trying to see what horrible things they can make, and then taking snapshots of the stupid headlines and putting them on Facebook. So it, it blows up in our face. The woman who in, came up with this idea got a promotion, right? At Newsweek, she would have been fired, right? Or, or, or she would never have launched because we would have tested it for a day. Uh, but she got a promotion because she took a risk, right? That was great. And this thing is still up there. They still promote it. They still want to pretend it's great, right? Um, another thing, no rules. HubSpot had one rule. There was no rule book. There was no employee guidebook that you got, like, use good judgment which of course means nothing, which if you all work in HR, you know means like disasters, right? Which is what happened, right? Um, because what one man's good judgment is, is another man's well, not so much, right? Okay, they love new organization structures. They're flat, they use holacracy, which is what Zappos uses, which is this thing where you operate in circles rather than in, in a traditional hierarchy. They adopt agile, they adopt lean, but what's interesting about it is they don't adopt agile like the way IBM does. IBM is now doing agile and it's like a billion dollar thing and they're gonna push it through the organization and it's all centralized. These guys just grab as, as they catch can, it's at a departmental, departmental level. Some you know, manager down low says, I kinda read this book about agile, I'm gonna grab two or three things I like. I'm gonna grab some stuff from lean. You know? I'm gonna put them together and make scrum and Kanban, I'm gonna make a scrum band. I don't care, you know? we'll have stand up meetings, but we'll do this. They really don't care about, I have to do it by the book. Right? It's very loose. They have this two pizza rule. No group should be more than enough, more than enough people than two pizza could feed. Um, and a friend of mine who runs technology at a startup in Boston told me this the other day. He said, it's also a different kind of people. Like the people you need in a startup are people who can work across traditional swim lanes. So people like me, I, I didn't do well, and he, I think my friend is kind of saying like, yeah, that's very predictable that you would not do well. You come from a world where you stay in your lane, right? Th to be in this world, you have to be sort of fluid. You have to be able to swim in and out of your lane. They're really fast to grab new tools. So they're all built on Amazon Web Services. Nobody runs their own data center, right? They use Slack, Okta, they have wikis. We had a wiki at HubSpot where anybody could comment on anything, any kind of long essay telling us why the company was all messed up or why they were great. Twilio, they have data and metrics. They love data. Decisions are really driven by data. And the CMO runs more tech budget than the CIO, right? Again, it's all decentralized. It's all pushed out to like, what does your group need? You, you want Slack? You just go get Slack, right? You just start using Slack. You create your own Slack groups. Um, they have an enemy. By this, I really mean they have a mission. They have a, 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 they have a, a purpose, right? They, they, but, but often that is focused on an enemy, right? One of the cool stories about Facebook is that when, when Google Plus, when Google was trying to come out with its own social network called Google Plus, that was going to try to rival Facebook. Facebook got wind of it, and, and Zuckerberg, you know, went into panic mode. They don't just go like, oh, we should look at this. Zuckerberg calls in all hands and says, look, these guys are trying to kill us. We're going to kill them. And he tells him this story from ancient Rome, because you know, Zuckerberg studied a lot of Latin in, in high school. Um, there's a story where, where, where Rome was at war with Carthage, and they had this saying, Carthago delenda est, Carthage must be destroyed, right? They had three wars, I think, trying to destroy Carthage, and they finally did. And when they did, they plowed the fields and they salted the earth so that nothing would ever grow there again, right? So Zuckerberg gets them all riled up like Carthago delenda de est. 
And they start making posters and putting up on the wall. They go into overdrive. They, you know, it's lockdown. They called it lockdown. Literally, the company's on lockdown. We're going to figure out everything that's in Google+. We're going to steal whatever's good. We're going to kill those guys. Like, that is our mission. We are going to kill them. They're bad. We are good. We're going to kill them, right? Startups really, really drive on that. At HubSpot, we had different enemies, but we definitely had enemies. And it was very personal. It was very much like, we are going to kill those guys because they want to kill us, right? And they're obsessed with growth, right? They don't care about profit, right? Which, again, is unfair and not really applicable to everybody. But the real thing is just grow, grow, grow as fast as you can. Now, the risk of that is you end up selling dollar bills for 75 cents. Um, but the, the, the urgency of it is, is, is actually really interesting. They just want to get numbers, get users, get traction, right? And if they can't, they kill it very fast. So to recap, six good things, millennials, they hire millennials who I think have great ideas and bring a lot of energy to an organization, and they have found various ways to make work appealing to those people. Their speed, they, they, they go really fast, speed above all else. They have no fear. New rules, I mean, no rules, new tools. They have an enemy of their mission, and they focus on just growth. But the bad stuff is also worth looking for. This is Travis Kalanick, the former and maybe future CEO of Uber, right? This is an article I wrote in the New York Times a few months ago, Jerks in the Startups They Ruin, right? The bad stuff is, I'm sorry, the bad stuff is my, my PowerPoint skills, but bro culture, lack of diversity, right, culture fit and workaholism, right? Bro culture has really taken over in startups. I mean, if you build a company that looks like a frat house and starts to run like a frat house, don't be surprised that it starts to have the problems that a frat house has, right? I don't know who decided that a frat house was a great model for a company. Um, and the bro culture leads to a lack of diversity because bros hire bros. VCs are bros who invest in bros that remind them of their younger selves. Those bros hire their friends who are bros. And <clears throat> they don't want to hire older people. They don't want to hire people of color. They don't want to hire women. Or they don't want to, certainly don't want to promote women. Women can go this high up in the organization, and they just are there to get harassed and assaulted. Right? So um, when I was at HubSpot, I, I realized I was the only, hardly anybody my age, which was really unnerving. I just had never been in a world where there weren't people of all ages. So it was suddenly like I was aware of my own age. I was aware of everybody else's age. I was aware of myself. We had an all hands for the first time, and there's 500 people in this big ballroom. I look around, and there's no black people. I'm like, literally, there's a room full of white kids in their 20s. I'm like, dude, I know Boston is not the most you know, progressive place, but even in Boston, you'd have to go out of your way to be that white, right? I mean, Klan rallies had a broader swath of the, of the Caucasian population, because there's not even just white, it was only one kind of white person, like these kids who looked like they came directly from a party in Cape Cod, and they landed in Kendall Square, right? So it was a tremendous problem, right? And I realized it's because of this thing of culture fit. You know, they, they would say, we, I like to hire people that I want to have a beer with after work. That's the stupidest reason to hire anyone anywhere, because you just end up hiring a bunch of yourself, right? Um, and workaholism. There's now a new thing. I wrote another op-ed recently in the Times about they celebrate workaholism. You're like, nine to five or so the week, bro, you know? Um, <clears throat> it's all about the hustle. Um, so, yeah, right. We're hustlers. Like, no, you're not, you know? Anyway, but um, um, it's, it's, it's very damaging, and it burns people out very quickly. And the other thing I think is probably not a good thing is this idea we're a team, not a family. I really don't like this idea. To me, it felt very callous, the idea that we're just a team, and, uh, you know, if, uh, if we find a better shortstop, you're out, you know? I mean, I'm not expecting a job for life, and I'm not expecting to sit around and do nothing and never get fired. But a lot of the way this gets applied is just basically someone doesn't like you, and they just, they just have permission to get rid of you. Um, so it's a little bit brutal. Um, anyway, how do you take the good and transfuse it? This is a scene from last season of Silicon Valley called The Blood Boy, where Gavin Belson is getting one of those blood transfusions from a teenage boy, right? So how do you get the transfusion, right? Um, one good way to start is Eric Reese, who wrote The Lean Startup, now has a new book coming out called The Startup Way. And he basically took the lean startup into GE. And the book is mostly a case study of the years he spent at GE trying to teach GE how to be a startup. But he also spent time at IBM, Intuit, Toyota, you know, Department of Education. Um, and he has some really interesting ideas. One of them is this, which I always thought was something we could have done in the media business, is use a VC model. Think of yourselves as VCs. The organization is a VC. You have metered funding versus entitlement final. And entitlement funding is you go in at the end of the year or the fourth quarter, and you say, what budget do you need for next year? And you say, I need this, because last year I had this, so now I should have that plus 3%, and I'm entitled to that. Metered funding is you create a project, and like the way VCs work is you get Series A, or you get a seed, and then Series A. But you get Series A, and it's all yours. Take it. It's yours. Do, you spend it all. You know? And 
You don't have to ask permission, just go. But when money's gone, if you haven't done anything good, you're not going to get the next round, right? So each time you sing for your supper, right? But I really believe you can behave like venture capitalists inside these organizations. I believe that at, at, in the media business, at Forbes and Newsweek, if we had done this, but we had to do it back, way back in the 90s, late 90s, when we were flush with cash from the dot-com boom, everybody's buying ads. Right then, we should have started either taking people inside the organization and turning them into entrepreneurs and giving them some budget, say, go build a team, go do this thing. If it flames out, fine, because remember, 75%, 90% are gonna fail. So you also have to give them permission to just fail, call it, call it a disaster, and quit, right? Don't be afraid, because otherwise you have people who like pretend it's succeeding forever and ever and ever, and, they, and, and it becomes a big problem, right? We, you know, I was sat there and got like, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post were invented while we were sitting there at Forbes and Newsweek watching them, and they grew up from nothing around us. Why didn't we create those? Because A, we couldn't internally, but why didn't we go invest outside, right? We could have, we just didn't think of ourselves as venture capitalists. <clears throat> I want to leave you with one example of a guy who I think is one of the best at running a company that's not a young company, but still acts like a startup. And it is Jensen Huang from, from uh, or Wang, I guess, at NVIDIA. NVIDIA is 24 years old, right? And they're in a pretty boring business, right? They make chips, right? Semiconductors. <clears throat> and he has this idea of, like, see the world through a child's eye. And this is a company that's, I call it a transformer. They're one of these companies that starts doing this, and then becomes this, and then becomes this, and then becomes this, like Amazon is one. Amazon started selling books, then they sold um, everything, then they sold, you know, you, know, you can buy clothes now, but then they, they launch AWS, they launch a cloud service. They're the number one, by far, the most dominant provider of cloud services in the world. A whole new business. Then they have their consumer electronics, Kindle and Echo. They just keep making new things. <clears throat> they keep transforming themselves. These guys started, this is how low their business was. 1998, this was their unglamorous, Business, graphics accelerator boards that you put in the back of a computer if you want to play video games. You know, they made the graphics run faster. <clears throat> a few years later, they find, figured out, God, if you take like a thousand of those things and you hook them together, and if you can figure out to write software that'll explo uh, exploit their capabilities, which is not trivial, but if you can do that, you can make a really powerful supercomputer. And people started doing it, so they started making uh, 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 chips for that. And now they have a $150 million business. A lot of the biggest supercomputers on Earth run NVIDIA graphics chips, those stupid video game cards, right? Um, they had all these customers in the car business because the car businesses do a lot of CAD, and they, so they need graphics, and they do a lot of wind tunnel simulations. So, so NVIDIA had a, was in all the car companies. And they went in and they listened. The other thing I think about Transformers is they have big ears, right? They listen. They listen more than talk, right? And they, and they, they went out and they talked to the car guys and said, well, you know, what's coming next? What, do you work, what are the big problems? And they said, well, autonomous cars, we really think. But you know what? It's, the, the biggest challenge of autonomous cars is you have to process huge amounts of data really, really fast. You have all these sensors around the car feeding stuff in. And they were like, geez, you know, our graphics chips would probably be good for that. So they start coming up with modules and now in the third generation and 80 car companies in the world or 80 different companies are using NVIDIA chips to build autonomous cars. That then leads to this next thing, which is they realize AI, deep learning, also are really, really processor intensive. And so now, they be, they, this is an exec at uh, NVIDIA, to me, we're in transforming into an artificial intelligence company. Like, that's what they've become, from making these stupid little cards that you'd buy and stick into the back of your old PC in the 90s, to this, right? The stock, meanwhile, check this out. Five years ago, they were at 12 bucks. They're now at 179, and you see where the big leap is, right? Right here, right? When the market starts waking up to the fact that, oh my God, autonomous cars are going to be big, AI is going to be big, who's going to benefit of that? Who's going to, who's going to sell the, the, the dungarees to the miners? Oh my God, NVIDIA. And the results, by the way, have taken off like crazy in the last, in the last year, just their, their, their revenues. I want to point out something, because I think leaders are very, very important at this. I think you can't do one of these transformations unless you have the right leader, right? And the leader sometimes transforms himself. That's Jensen Wang now. He's 54, right? That's what he used to look like. It's, the other guy I love is John Ledger from T-Mobile. That's John Ledger, right? John Ledger just became hippie John Ledger, right? Um, to show you what they've done, Ledger joined in 2012. The stock's now at 62, up from 20, right? Not as dramatic. I don't know if the recommendation is that we should all grow our hair really long and get leather jackets, but it seems to be a trend, and I think maybe it works. Um, I'm going to skip a couple slides, this one and this one. Well, this one's worth it. Um, 
we have, in a way, the really good luck or the really bad luck to be living in interesting times. This is a very unattractive man named Klaus Schwab who runs the World Economic Forum, the guys who have the Davos thing. And his big deal is the fourth industrial revolution. I think he also plays Lord Varys on Game of Thrones. But um, <laughs> he, uh, a technological revolution that will alter whether we live, work, and relate to another, unlike anything humankind has, has seen before. And unfortunately, we get to live in it. And we can't, you know, just quit working. So. Um, it's either exciting or scary, or both, right? Entire industries being blown up in front of our faces. Netflix, uh, not uh, Blockbuster, Tower Records, um, Borders books. My hero, one of my heroes anyway, has always been Steve Jobs. <clears throat> and, and I love this quote of his, stay hungry, stay foolish, right? And I kind of always wondered you know, what he, he meant by that. He gave it at a commencement address, right, at Stanford, when he was 50, I think five years before he died. But he gave this speech. If you go back and watch this commencement, that's amazing. Because when you read his bio, you realize he knew he was dying, right? And he gave this speech, and he talked about death. And he said, death is the ultimate change agent, and maybe it's a good thing, because it sweeps out the old and it brings in the new. And once you realize you're going to die, once you, become face, you come face to face with that, you realize you let go of this idea that you have something to lose, right? That there's something you should be afraid of. There is no fear. There's no loss. And this is a guy who I believe really ran Apple like a startup right to the end. Right to the end, they were inventing new things, right? He came, you know, they went from PCs to mobile devices, um, and Jobs is the one who did that. He would disrupt his own business. He would cannibalize his own business to build the new one, right? He was relentlessly pushing forward, always learning, right? Um, I think this is really good advice. Stay foolish, right? The idea that it's, don't, it's not that you should try not to look foolish. It's you, you should go out of your way to look foolish, right? Do things that are foolish because something good will come out of it, right? The last thing I'll leave you with is I think the time to do this in every industry is now if, it have, if you haven't already. Like, I really wish we could go back in time and do this in the media business. I, one of my huge regrets is that back in the 90s at Forbes, even in 2008 when I went to Newsweek, that I hadn't dared to speak up, to say something to someone at the top, right? And I didn't because I was a piano, I was just a rank and file guy, who am I? I can't go talk to them about that kind of stuff. But I think it would feel better now, even if I had tried and it didn't work, right? <clears throat> and one way to think of it is to become a venture capitalist, right? Turn your people into entrepreneurs, right? And the ones who get it, the employees who get it are the ones who are going to thrive. They're not all going to get it, right? I think you can create opportunities inside the company, but you can also look for opportunities outside the company, right? You can bring that young blood, young ideas in, right? I finally also think that you guys, CLOs, are actually the most important people in companies right now, right? The, the biggest key to this is learning, right? All those people who have to learn to be entrepreneurs, who have to learn new skills, and they have to be aware that they have to go get it on their own, right? I was very afraid when I left, uh, uh, well, for the last 10 years of my career, but that fear has driven me. Because I feel like I have to stay ahead of this destruction, right? If you make people that aware of that, and then you hand them learning, this is the key to the future. I think they'll go after it. Finally, in addition to investing in those people, I think you really need to think about investing in yourself, right? Your own skills as a C-level executive, as whatever you are, a vice president. No matter where you are in your career, you have to know that that career isn't going to be the same 10 years from now. And you really need to transform yourself. And the way to do that is to take risks, to be the change agent, to be the one that I wasn't back at Forbes and Newsweek, to be the one who stands up and puts up your hand and goes to the top and says, look, this is how we have to change, right? Um, I will leave you with one last quote. It's one of my favorites because it's sort of the story of my life. Thankfully, persistence is a great substitute for talent. I don't think you have to be a genius to do this. I think you just have to refuse to go away. That's sort of me. I've never been that good a writer. I just wouldn't stop, so they finally had to publish me. Um, anyway, thank you. I've gone over my time, but, but thank you very much.